Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Rudolf Farah. I'm one of the co-directors of Voting Power and Procedures here at LSE. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Vincent Cable, who's here this evening to deliver the fifth Leverhulme Trust-sponsored Voting Power in Practice lecture. Um, Dr. Cable is MP uh, for the Liberal Democrats in Twickenham and his party's deputy leader, shadow chancellor, and treasury spokesman. Um, Dr. Cable's considerable reputation precedes him, and I'm not going to restate all of that that you can pick up on the net and elsewhere, uh, so that you, you've come to hear him, and that's what you're going to get as much time to, to, to listen to him as possible. So I'm going to confine my rather brief opening remarks to what voting power and practice is about, which brings Dr. Cable and others like him here to talk. Um, this is the 10th anniversary of voting power and practice at the LSE. We started in 2000 at the Center for Philosophy and Natural Social Science, and we have been kindly and generously supported by the Leverhulme Trust with two grants, which is rather unusual. Normally, it's one three-year shot, and we've had uh, two lots of their money. Um, VPP is dedicated to the research and investigation of how best to achieve successful empowerment and legitimate representative governance. Um, the Voting Power and Practice project is now in its third year and it is focused on an attempt to create a mutually informative dialogue between practitioners, that is politicians and their advisors, uh, lawyers who, who act in these uh, test cases and so on, in governance and uh, academic researchers and scientists in the subject areas. Voting power is a very cross-disciplinary subject which uh, has philosophers, mathematicians, economists, political scientists and the like um, involved. Um, the success of the project has been quite simply outstanding, uh, much more than we could ever have hoped for, um, as well as our school public lecture program, of which this is the fifth. Um, in this three-year tranche of money. Um, we, and, the, and the purpose of this is to reach a wider community, obviously, and I'll say just one final remark about that in, in a moment. Um, in our summer workshops, where we meet every summer for three or four days, we cover in depth uh, a subject in voting power, voting system design, or what are ironic procedures for voting power. The first research project is a rather maverick um, area of research, which is somehow to bring practitioners to give a voice to what would otherwise be very ethereal and very airy-fairy, and we'd be sitting in our tunnels contemplating yet another set of formulae or another model. Um, what we've covered in the past in our, our workshops are the problems of ensuring the core democratic principle of one person, one vote. That was after the first, which was a theoretical one, three years ago, sorry, three years ago, the next uh, voting power um, uh, meeting concentrated on one person, one person, one vote, and the peculiar problems of gerrymandering. And that was a great success because we brought some lawyers in from America who had uh, fought the cases uh, in most notably the Texas gerrymandering case. The lead lawyer for the Democrats who brought that to the Supreme Court came here to talk along with Ian McLean, who talked about the Boundary uh, uh, Commission in this country and tried to sort of show where the similarities and differences uh, were. Um, last year, we focused on developing governance models of corporate and intergovernmental institutions with shareholder voting. Um, this was particularly interesting following the economic crisis um, and an area which we, will, which we are currently developing further and hope to develop into another major research project. Um, this was <coughs> principally trying to determine, and possibly Vince will actually cover this, a little bit of this tangentially tonight, um, the thorny problem of share, the shareholder issue. Um, uh, a common stock company is supposedly governed by its shareholders. Well, that sounds good. So when you have catastrophic decisions that are taken, you somehow feel that the shareholders have kind of got it wrong. Not true. Not at all true. I mean, if I were to take a hand count and say, well, you know, how many people think that, what, what, what is the institutional ownership of the largest share 
uh, the, the, the largest uh, public uh, limited companies. I'm sure you'd be very surprised to find that the major major corporations are in fact there's hardly any percentage of individual share ownership at all. So it's a it's a series of interconnected institutions that operate at that level. So thinking about as I'm sure we all kind of think that shareholders count up the number of shares you have, therefore have the number of votes. This clearly can't be the way to run this ship, okay? Um, it raises a lot of interesting questions. Um, and this summer, our final workshop, which maybe should have been the one that we started with, will concentrate on an evaluation of alternative voting procedures. Now, this is particularly relevant subject tonight. Um, the three main parties in the UK now offer distinct choices between voting systems. PR for the Liberal Dems, Liberal Democrats, first past the post uh, for the Conservatives, and for Labour, the alternative voting system. So it's quite fair to ask now whether party preferences of voting system, should it be an electoral issue spelled out explicitly in the various manifestos. Um, I think since being in the common market, we're no longer completely hoodwinked by the idea that there is only one voting system and what have you. Uh, so one view would be to get it into the public arena, to have a discussion about it, and then possibly people would begin to be able to vote with some sort of idea uh, of what, what, what people would be able to make a choice, first of all, of the kind of system that they would like to have and why they would like to have that system. Um, Europeans, any you know, uh, ordinary German person knows exactly why they have a proportional representative system. Okay. So, Dr. Cable, I'm sure, will shed a little bit of light on the subject tonight. Dr. Cable, thank you. Well, thank you for your warm welcome and, and for inviting me here. Um, I, I approach this with a certain amount of trepidation, um, partly when I discovered what I'd agreed to talk about. Um, I, I normally talk about economics and I suppose I've developed a sort of reasonable sort of comfort zone around that general set of problems. And I only realized at the very last minute that I'd agreed to talk about electoral reform, which is a subject I decided when I was a student about 40 years ago I would never venture into. And I, I remember going to talks of political anoraks about the Dahomey voting system and the workings of the single transferable vote. And I realized this is something I didn't understand and would never understand and didn't need to understand. And I've sort of ticked this off as a subject not to go into, a bit like sort of reality television, I have a mental blockage about it. But then I discovered I've come here to talk to you about it. Um, but I think there is, the, 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 the way I will try to get over this hurdle is by suggesting to you that uh, what we have in the UK is a very deep economic crisis. Uh, but we also have a political crisis at the same time, and they're, they're interconnected. Um, we, we've seen both of them in a fairly superficial way. I mean, the, we all knew there was an economic crisis when people started queuing outside a bank, something that hadn't happened in this country since 1866. Um, and we've discovered that this was, is, uh, you know, a very profound problem on different levels. Uh, we also had a serious but essentially superficial uh, piece of evidence about a political crisis in the form of the expenses scandal last year where a small number of MPs engaged in criminal activities and a large number of others were foolish, greedy or careless uh, and have brought themselves and the Parliament into disrepute. But I would argue that this was actually very much a surface phenomenon and there is a much deeper problem with the functioning of British democracy. And the two problems are actually interconnected, because I think one could argue that one of the reasons we are in a major economic crisis was not you know, a failure of particular individuals or political parties, though I, you know, I'll do my best to pin blame when the election comes, uh, but a failure of the political class in general, because the underlying problems, which were a badly regulated and excessively large financial services and particularly banking sector grew up on the political patronage of people of very different views, um, having survived what turned out to be wholly unsatisfactory legislative scrutiny. We built up uh, an extraordinary common uh, consensus that, and all the attributes and the debts associated with it, and we discovered we'd created a property bubble 
and many of these things cut way across political parties. And as we come out of this crisis, I think what will um, worries me deeply is that the British political system, as it's now evolved, simply isn't strong enough to cope with what will be a major, major problem of clearing up, particularly the fiscal uh, contraction that needs to happen over the next few years. And I will argue that these economic and political phenomena are interrelated. Now, why do I think that the political system is in a deep sense of crisis? I think there are several elements to it. They're interconnected, but I'll say a little bit about each of them. I think, first of all, we have the phenomenon in the UK, but it's not just in the UK, which is the erosion of the nation state and the political institutions around it, eroded on top from supranational forms of governance and global business, and from, from below by devolution. That's the first problem. Secondly, we have a parliament that is increasingly impotent. Uh, we have effectively an elected dictatorship in which parliament plays an almost entirely passive and <coughs> symbolic role rather than a functional one. Secondly, we have party system that no longer works because parties have become decayed and no longer operate as a transmission of people's preferences in the way they did. And I think, fourthly, um, what is left of the British state has become highly over-centralised so that we've had the destruction uh, not only of effective democratic accountability at a national level but at a local level as well. And I think all those elements together combined make for a very serious political problem and which something which needs very far-reaching reform. Let me just say a little bit about each of those in turn. I think, first of all, it's become something of a platitude, it doesn't do any harm to repeat it, uh, that the close economic integration of the world economy has had the effect of undermining much of the freedom of discretion of national governments, including our own, uh, international capital flows, trade, and the rest of it. I wrote a book which I'm sure is gathering dust on your shelves, called um, Globalization and Global Governance, which was about the mismatch between what was happening through market integration and what was happening politically, and that's an acute problem in the UK. And as and it isn't just um, economic activity, it's the rules governing economic activity, whether they're through the World Trade Organization or the European Union, uh, which increasingly determine the way in which commerce occurs rather than by a national parliament. And even other aspects of our lives are governed by uh, supranational, international legislative forms. There's a fascinating example this week which I think largely escaped detection, uh, but it illustrates this point well. Uh, we are, of course, in the middle of the Iraq inquiry and the, the role of United Nations law in the national freedom of action in declaring war. But there's, a, there's an even better example which occurred, I think, on Tuesday, where the Supreme Court ruled that United Nations law in respect of um, uh, personal behavior of people who are suspected of terrorism holding funds prevailed over British domestic law. I'm, I'm simplifying a 150-page judgment it was much more complicated than that, but the Supreme Court ruled that the British government had no right to impound the financial assets of suspected terrorists. Not because it offended against some aspect of British law, or even that it offended against the European Union, but it offended against the United Nations. And this was a binding legal obligation. So, if you're an American Tea Party enthusiast, you'd be absolutely agog that here is a major nation state being told what to do by the United Nations, you know, world conspiracy and all that, but it's happening in here. And I use it as an example of how increasingly governments, parliament in this case, are constrained by rules established outside the nation state. So we have this process of erosion from on top, and we have erosion from below. 
uh, and notably through devolution. I don't want to put that in a pejorative way. I was a great advocate, strong advocate from the days I lived and uh, taught at Glasgow University, um, a strong advocate of devolution within the United Kingdom. But it is worth remembering, and I think we will have cause to remember this more in the years ahead, that uh, the United Kingdom is a group of nations. It isn't one nation. And several of the nations, particularly Scotland, uh, want to be respected as such and have achieved a significant degree of devolution of economic decision making and political decision making. And I don't mention this purely as an academic point because I think in the next few years uh, that particular issue will test the destruction uh, the strength of British democratic institutions and I, I put it in that slightly apocalyptic way because what may well happen at the next general election is we'll get a conservative government and all kind of scenarios but let's imagine that we do with a reasonable majority in the United Kingdom um, a mandate you would say under the existing rules but with probably at most uh, two MPs in Scotland uh, and a Scottish nationalist government in the Scottish Assembly. You know, it doesn't require much to see how this will precipitate a major constitutional crisis. Now, you know, you can tell all kind of stories about how that might evolve, and it probably wouldn't evolve through the UK breaking up. It would involve some Quebec-style compromise, probably. Uh, but it would almost certainly lead to a, an even greater devolution of decision-making Tax, pay, tax raising powers and other things to devolve parliaments in Scotland and probably in Wales too, further contributing to the erosion of national government and the national parliament. So that's my first major point. There's a, a, a major historical process taking place, globalization of economic activity, the establishment of rules at a global or European level, conflicting with, to some extent overriding, the activities of national parliaments and governments and a parallel process of erosion from below. So that's the first major part of this crisis. The second is parliament. And I wrote a slightly provocative article a few uh, months ago describing myself as a parliamentary eunuch. I think it's a, quite a good description of the role of MPs. And I became increasingly conscious of becoming a decorative part of the British Constitution rather than a practical part of it. Uh, the reason we are in this position, I think, is that it's partly historical. Uh, Britain does not have an independent legislature in the way that the United States does. Uh, Parliament, or rather the House of Commons, the House of Lords I'll come to in a moment, the House of Commons <laughs> provides the government and the government controls the House of Commons providing there's a majority for the ruling party. And since one person heads the government, we have effectively one person, the Prime Minister, who chooses the government, and the government manages the business of Parliament. Uh, you have a, an elected dictatorship, and I don't mean that in an inflammatory way, but I think simply a description of what happens. And certainly in the last 12 years I've been a Member of Parliament, I've been very conscious of how this works in practice. First of all, it is virtually impossible to defeat the government on almost any matter, uh, particularly if the government has a comfortable majority. Very, very, very occasionally there is an issue on which uh, backbenchers rebel and you achieve a victory, but it's very rare. Uh, the only reversals of policy that now occur are in the elected House of Lords. Secondly, we have very, very weak scrutiny of government. We have a select committee system, which is a considerable advance on Parliament as it was, uh, and it does provide, in many cases, good cross-questioning of ministers. The work of the Treasury Select Committee and the bankers was an exemplary case. But, of course, select committee chairman and select committee membership is decided by party whips and by government and the government removes awkward chairman of select committees um, and it fixes membership of those committees so that the capacity of those committees to challenge government is very seriously circumscribed. Uh, then another feature of the way parliament now functions 
is that much legislation doesn't take place through primary legislation, which is, of course, debated and amended on the floor of Parliament. It takes place through what are called statutory instruments, secondary legislation, uh, typically a complex piece of law, whether it's to do with economic matters like financial services or civil matters, terrorism. Uh, government will introduce a framework bill on which Parliament will deliberate and then the practical matters, the really important issues, are dealt with through uh, orders uh, brought through statutory instruments which MPs have no power to amend even if they wish to. They can speak on them and vote on them but have no capacity to amend. Uh, and I think just as a, as a sort of, this isn't a substantive point, but in terms of colour, I think what we've also seen, and this sort of reflects what I've already said, Parliament ceasing to become a kind of national forum in the way that it once was. And it's happened through slow, steady steps. Uh, parliamentary speeches are rarely, if ever, referred to in the press. Of course, there is a parliamentary channel, but you have to be pretty enthusiastic to watch that. Um, uh, and uh, and interest, you know, strikingly to me, as somebody who's part of it, the best performers uh, rarely, if ever, appear. Probably the best orator in Parliament is, is George Galloway. Superb speaker, uh, very effective, very convincing speaker. I've never seen him for the last couple of years. He appears every so often. He obviously doesn't think it's worth his time. And unfortunately, that reflects in many ways uh, the standing of what Parliament has achieved. So I think there is a real crisis of parliamentary legitimacy uh, which, of course, the expenses crisis has highlighted, but is merely a symptom. And it is partly in the nature of the British constitutional practice of the legislature being the source of the government, but it's gradually been eroded through these procedural processes that I've described to you. Well, how could that be reversed? How could it be changed? Well, the new Speaker Burko is determined, and I think genuinely determined, to try to shift the balance of power back to MPs away from government. And there are all kind of small ways in which this can happen. Uh, control over House of Commons procedure, guillotining being restricted, uh, trying to restrict the ability of government to set the business of Parliament, which is what it does. Uh, and Burko is working on that, and we may achieve a few small changes for the better. There is a very strong mood to strengthen select committees and allow them to be elected by MPs rather than chosen by government. Uh, another very important reform that would make a great deal of difference, particularly in the current economic context, is if British MPs had some say in respect of public spending. One of the more bizarre features of the British Parliament is that we have detailed scrutiny of tax measures. Every tax measure is scrutinised in excruciating detail by the Finance Bill. Um, very often we don't understand the measures because they're too complicated, but at least we scrutinise them. But there is no scrutiny of public spending, none except ex post through the Public Accounts Committee. A decision to switch you know, X billion from defence to education or to cut Y billion out of the health service, that those are decisions that never come anywhere near Parliament. Unlike the American Congress, which you know, annually appropriates funding for government, we have no such role in scrutiny or approval. It's a major omission, and I think Parliament's standing and importance would be greatly enhanced if we dealt with that problem. Some people David Cameron, I think my own party, I can't remember our policy on this, but I think we're also advocating <laughs> cutting the number of MPs. And uh, it would make the place a bit more business-like and a bit cheaper. But, of course, one has to be careful about these measures of that kind because given what I've said about Parliament being the source of government uh, and given the enormous number of government ministers and parliamentary private secretaries, what you would then be doing is reducing the number of independent critical MPs, so it might actually be a bad idea rather than a good idea, but it appeals to the public. What is, is more interesting, and has more potential, I think, 
is looking at reform of the House of Lords, because at the moment the House of Lords, unlike the Commons, has a real function in scrutinising legislation, frequently votes down um, government measures, much more independent-minded, much less under the control of whips, and you could argue that, well, maybe we can improve the functioning of Parliament by letting the House of Lords work better. And indeed, I think there's something to be said for that. But if there is any change in the way Parliament operates in the short term, it is likely to be, I would have thought, through reform of the House of Lords. And here we get into quite a tricky set of issues. Uh, when I joined the House of Commons um, 12 years ago, uh, there was a very large number of heredity MPs, uh, sorry, members of the House of Lords. Uh, this was, I think, rightly considered to be outrageous. Uh, why should uh, somebody whose distant ancestor was a mistress of a king uh, be deciding on key bits of government legislation? This is completely wrong. And when the House of Lords defied, the House of Commons actually defied government, uh, we voted to severely restrict the number of hereditary peers. The consequence of that is that the House of Lords is now dominated by appointed peers. And many of these appointed peers are outstanding people, uh, people who have given great public service or worked to distinguished positions in universities or whatever. Uh, but the vast majority are not. The vast majority are there appointed because of their party loyalties or because they've paid a large cheque to party funds. And this is not a good basis for legitimacy. And although at the moment we have what I would call an unstable equilibrium, in other words, the House of Lords does useful work, we listen to it, or Parliament listens, the lower House of Parliament listens to the upper house, they tweak legislation. If there were ever a major challenge, a major confrontation, uh, it's very difficult to see how the House of Lords could survive in its present form because it has no underlying legitimacy. It is, they are creatures of the Prime Minister and past Prime Ministers. And that's why there is a strong move to move towards election of the peers and to have a parallel election based on probably on a different voting system and on a different principle, elected for say 10 years rather than five and not renewable. Um, to, to, to have an elected House of Lords. The problem with it, and it is a real problem, is that if the House of Lords really became serious, you'd have two competing Houses of Parliament, which would have dominance, which would have real legitimacy. It's a real problem that the House of Lords in its present form functions in a, in a kind of way, pragmatically, that has no legitimacy, or you could have a House of Lords that does have legitimacy, but then would create a whole set of secondary problems in turn. So that is a summary of, I think, roughly where we are with the debates on parliamentary reform. Let me go on to the third set of issues, which is related to the, um, the gradual weakening and decay of the party system. There are several elements to that. If you look at a typical opinion poll, it's roughly 40, 30, 20, 10. At the moment, it's 40 Conservative, 30 Labour, 20 us, 10 the others. Well, you know, it moves around. Different polls give different results. Um, a decade ago, it was 40, 30, 20, 10, actually a bit less than 10. Uh, but the two parties at the top were the other way around. But that's roughly the configuration. Now, the implication of that, of course, is that even if you get governments that win elections with large majorities, uh, they probably have at most 40% of the popular vote. Uh, you may say, well, that's not too bad. But the other problem which is occurring is not just that a majority of people now vote for none of the above, but that growing numbers don't vote at all. And typically, we will have a 60% turnout at the just general election. So you can see where the arithmetic lead in. You can have a government elected with a parliamentary majority on the basis of, well, you can do the mental arithmetic, 60 times 40. We're talking one in four voters. And what would worry me, I, I, I have a party axe to grind, but would worry me if I were a member of the public, is that we're approaching an election with horrendous long-term economic problems requiring very, very difficult choices uh, requiring public engagement 
on a scale that we've never had before, which will it almost certainly be carried through by a government that's got the support of a maximum of one in four of the voting public. There is a real question of legitimacy and underpinning for this democratic model. Um, it, is, it, it, it is actually, I think, worse than that in the sense that what we're now getting, which we didn't have a generation ago, is not just more fragmentation of the vote, but more geographical polarisation. Uh, I quoted the specific case of Scotland, but Scotland is only one example of this. Um, many large cities no longer have any effective representation by Conservatives at all. Most of the battles in the north of England cities will be fought out between Labour and the Liberal Democrats. There are large areas of suburban and rural Britain which the Labour Party have effectively evacuated. Uh, they will not be, they will put up a candidate in my seat, but you know, they will not expect to win and they will hopefully win their deposit. But it is between Liberal Democrats and Conservatives and there are large numbers of places where we, we are very weak as well. So you're getting geographical concentration of parties. The idea of a national party is now becoming rather remote. There once were national parties, but they no longer are. They come from particular clusters of support. All of these things eroding uh, any sense that a party can command widespread support. And the problems are compounded by the decline in membership, which is acute in all parties. And I could make a story, we're doing better than others, and I, I don't know what the figures are, but I mean, all parties have suffered massive hemorrhage of membership. And that's not just important in itself, it's important indirectly because members always used to be the sources of funding, uh, because members no longer contribute money, uh, on the scale that they did, parties have to turn to rich individuals to, to finance them, and so we have corruption. I mean, not corruption in a necessarily illegal way, but corruption in in a in a way that common sense way. Some rich individual pays large amounts of money; they want something back. And that's what as politics has unfortunately become, and there is now a big debate, which is wholly unresolved, about how to discipline party funding. It's reached an own pass because none of us think the British public want to finance party politics. Um, rich individuals don't wish to be uh, curtailed. Uh, parties have their vested interests and there is no agreement. And so we go into an election in which a few individuals um, supporting particular parties will have vastly disproportionate influence based on money. Uh, so there are many ways in which the party system is gradually unravelling and in a way that <coughs> makes it no longer functional. Of course there are ways in which this could be improved and I'm sure they could be improved. Uh, first of all you could bring in primaries to have the public having a choice of candidates. This is a way of infusing more energy and interest at a local level and the Conservatives have experimented that actually rather successfully. Uh, the problem with universal primaries is again money. It takes a lot of money to send 100,000 people or whatever it is, 60,000 voters, uh, lots of target letters and leaflets and telephone calls. So who provides the money? Well again it will be rich sponsors or rich individuals as candidates, which greatly narrows down the candidate base of politics. So candidate, the primaries have a role, I'm sure, but it has that fundamental limitation to it. So that is why I think there is an increasing interest in the idea of changing the voting system in order to try to give a stronger base to p public choice. Uh, uh, traditionally, uh, the arguments for electoral reform came from my party, and you could argue that it was driven in part, or probably substantial part, by self-interest which is probably why not a great deal happened as certainly at a UK level. But I think it's now becoming uh, accepted that the political system doesn't function properly and that we need to try to do things in a different way. 
And I think the thought of it has been encouraged by the fact that we have, in other spheres of political life, had experiments with electoral reform, which, broadly speaking, within the last decade, have been pretty successful, I think. Uh, Scotland has a system of proportional voting, which is called the so-called AV+, Plus. I'll talk about that in a moment, based largely on the German model. And Scotland, more importantly, now has a fully PR system, single transfer of the vote, for local councils. There are no longer any single party councils in Glasgow, except in Scotland, except narrowly in Glasgow. They have adopted the STV, the basically the Irish model of voting. We have a proportional system of election to the London Assembly and a what, what, what effectively is a, a, an AV system for the London Mayor. Uh, we have a party list system for European parliaments that works not well. It's not a great advertisement for the PR system, but there are particular problems with the European Parliament because of the enormous numbers of people that they have to represent. But I think the way the debate is shaping up at the present is that the Conservatives, perhaps for obvious reasons, wish to stick with the existing system. Uh, the Labour Party is in, currently in a state of intense internal debate about whether to adopt the AV system. Just to explain it in very simple terms, the AV system is broadly the system that operates in Australia, uh, in which you keep constituencies as they are, but in pe which people vote 1, 2, 3 rather than X, and the second preference possibly the third, depending on how they divide the system, is transferred until an MP gets 50% of the vote. That's the key. You can't have MPs elected with 30% of the vote as they do at the moment, or 26% in the Highlands of Scotland, where you probably have four parties of roughly equal strength. So under the AV system, every MP has to have half the voters voting for them, either first or second. Uh, and that's the position the Labour Party appear to be wanting to take up. They're considering and they're fiercely debating in Cabinet, as I understand it, whether to put this forward for a referendum in the next Parliament. Now, there are all kinds of arguments about whether that's just a tactical ploy or whether they mean it, but it does look as if for the first time for a very long time, uh, one of the two biggest parties is going to adopt this as its formal policy, and it looks as if they are. Uh, my own party remains uh, committed to proportionality through the single transferable vote, as I say, the Scottish local government model, uh, but we've always said that we would be relaxed about a system like that recommended by the Jenkins Commission, uh, which Tony Blair set up, which is the so-called AV+, Plus, which operates for Scottish parliamentary elections, under which you have constituencies, as now, uh, and on which you have a top-up in order to create a proportional number of MPs in Parliament. And it's, uh, on the basis of fairly limited experience, seems to work reasonably well in Scotland, at least as a way of expressing people's choice in a country where you have four parties, let alone three. So that is all I want to say about the party system. I'm rather exceeding the time you wanted me to talk for, so let me just round up with a couple of minutes on the fourth and last of the big political problems that I think we have and contribute to this crisis, which is over-centralisation. Now, there's a bit of a contradiction. Here. The British state, on one level, has decentralised substantially in the last decade through devolution, but at the same time, in England and Wales, and within Scotland also, for different reasons, um, the, 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 the national parliament has become, or national government, has become much more centralised. And local government has been considerably weakened. And there have been a whole steps, set of steps that have contributed to this process going back half a century. Local authorities have been deprived of many of their functions, uh, in some cases by law. I was a city councillor in Glasgow in the early 70s where we were forbidden for the first time by national governments for setting rents. We're not allowed to supply free school milk to schools and a whole set of prohibitions has gradually crept in from central government. Uh, Two-tier local government has had the effect in many cases of weakening the power of both. Uh, revenue has become increasingly dependent on central government. There is a shocking figure 
at a national level in the UK that 80% of all local government funding comes from government. Obviously, uh, central national government calls the tune, dictates what can be spent and what can't be spent. Uh, local authorities are now not allowed to keep commercial rates, which was a form of diverse revenue, which they now lost. Uh, a few years ago, the latter stages think of the Conservative government, even the only source of independent local government revenue, council tax, was capped so that local authorities no longer have the freedom to set their own tax rates. And more recently, we've had a proliferation of central government controls over everything that local councils do. The Audit Commission has become a vast apparatus uh, controlling, monitoring, mentoring everything that councils and councillors do. And uh, local councils have just become a very, very pale shadow of what local government used to be. So local government has been severely uh, curtailed at a local democracy is, is largely meaningless now in the UK. So we have problems at a national level, weakness at a local level. All of this in these different ways contributes to a, what I would call a systemic political crisis in the UK, which coincides with the biggest economic crisis we've had since 1929. Uh, and uh, it's not clear how we're going to get out of it. Uh, but I've made a few suggestions along the way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we start the questions, um, if you, when you're chosen to, to give a question, if you could actually just state who you are and what your affiliation is, that would be helpful. Um, and I want to suggest what the drill is going to be for when we leave. Um, when we've finally finished, um, I'll go with Vince out the door. We'll be escorted out, apparently. And uh, everything has its price. Uh, there's a book signing going on at the back, and Vince has kindly agreed to do a few autographs. So um, if you want to get a, a, a look at the book and um, a signature of his, then that will happen for a short period after, after the event. Um, I'd like to sort of exert client's privilege and ask a question myself first and then I'll open it up. Well, actually, it's two questions I'd like you to briefly answer, if possible. Um, and they're uh, very brief. Um, corporate governance um, through common stock, um, in the light of the crisis and so on, and the problems that there are, it would appear, at the governance level, kind of thinking being that, you know, if I had shares in that company, I wouldn't have done that sort of thing if I'd had a voice and so on. What do you feel about the view? Um, what kind of suggestion would you give as to how corporations should be governed and whether or not common stock is the appropriate vehicle for counting up a person's weight and ultimately power within an organization? That's the first question. And the other one is, um, why wouldn't you favor simply a federated UK along the American model so that you'd have you know, checks and balances happening and you would have you know, the four uh, parts of the, the UK, or, or whatever it turns out to be, three or four parts of the UK forming the United States of uh, Britain? Well, I think the answer to the second is very simple. Certainly, I and my party do believe Britain should be federally structured like Canada and the United States. We do think that is the right model and would take a lot of grief out of the potential tensions uh, with Scotland. Um, th there is a problem, of course, with federalism in the UK, is that the, the bits are not the right, are not equally shaped. Exactly. This is this is the problem, and an attempt was made to get round this by inventing English regionalism. Um, the problem was that when that was put to the vote in the northeast, uh, nobody felt sufficiently strongly about it to want northeastern regional government. So you would have England with its 55 million or whatever it is, and uh, Northern Ireland with one and a half. I mean, it's a very unbalanced federation, but. As a, as a concept, I think that is the right way of proceeding. On corporate governance, I, partly because of time, I, I was having struggling enough to say what I wanted to say about governance uh, in, the, in the political field without talking about corporate governance. But 
there is a serious problem here, and I think it was beautifully illustrated last week with the craft takeover, mm. it exemplified all the problems here. Um, what happened was, as you may remember, Lord Mandelson said the government is going to fight this to the last death. I can't forgotten the phrase. And it then emerged that, that, that there were absolutely no possible way he could do anything about it, uh, despite the fact that it, there was a state-owned bank providing the money. Uh, um, so it, 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 illust it illustrated my first point about the weakness of the state in the face of economic globalization. But it also illustrated some weaknesses in our national system of corporate governance, because essentially what happened was that hedge funds acquired 30% of the stock uh, because they thought the stock was over undervalued and they, what they saw an opportunity to make a short-term killing, uh, and they used their votes to support the craft takeover despite the fact that most independent observers, people like Warren Buffett, uh, argued that this was a terrible deal uh, for the shareholders, right. quite apart from the national interest, it was a terrible deal. But it was a good deal for the hedge funds and they used their votes uh, to promote the takeover. So there is a question which is why we continue. I think we're the only country in the Western world that has one share, one vote. Mm -hmm. um, that should be looked at. I mean, one obvious way of looking at it would be to say that if you acquire a share in a company, you can't vote for 12 months. That would cut the hedge funds out. Short sellers. Uh, it would cut the short sellers out altogether. But people would be forced to take a long-term view about decision making. I also think we need to reopen the whole process of um, mergers and uh, monopolies. I mean, we used to have a fairly tough system whereby if a company wanted to take over another, it had to be reviewed by the competition authorities. These days it's very permissive, uh, despite all the evidence that most, most takeovers are value destroying in a shareholder sense, quite apart from national interest. So we've got a terrible system of corporate governance. Uh, it's been badly exposed in the recent crisis and it really does need reform. Thanks. Uh, chap in the blue shirt here first. Do you want to wait for the mic to come up? Just. Um, Peter Sosu, uh, LSE. Uh, you've indicated that Liberal Democrats uh, would tend to support um, uh, perhaps the STV system most of all, and, and, and perhaps also um, the AV plus system. It seems to me that. Um, that those two systems plus AV are really all part of a family of very close related systems. In fact, of course, AV is just a version of STV in which you have one MP per constituency. Um, AV is a version of AV plus in which the plus component is zero. So if you drew them on the Venn diagram, you'd see AV was right at the heart of it. Um, really what I want to ask you is whether you would welcome um, a change towards AV as at least a first step in the direction of electoral reform. And of course, it has the advantage that you don't have to fundamentally change the constituency system, which you would have to do, for example, with, with STV? Yes, well, we have said that it is a step towards a better system and um, would approach it in that way. But I think it is important to be clear that it has serious defects, which the Jenkins report set out very clearly. Uh, first of all, it is not proportional at all and may give you an outcome which is highly disproportional. Uh, and secondly, um, the experience of the Australians uh, and countries that have had this system is that it can magnify swings rather than dampen them. So uh, although it, it is an, an improvement in one sense, that it, make, it ensures that members of parliament uh, are people who are at least acceptable to half their voters in that sense, it, and it maintains the constituency link, which as an MP I tend to value, but I don't know whether the public do. Um, it, it does have severe drawbacks if you're trying to create a system which has real long-term durability and legitimacy. It's, uh, That's all right, we don't need it for that close, actually. It's more of a puzzlement than a question. I mean, the way I see is that British politics is in a vortex of at least three cycles. The first one throughout the decade, not just now, when I ask people, I say, look, this country's been torn out by 
I'm sorry. But, I'm, I'm sorry to but, cut across you, but I don't think that we can actually have. Here, yeah, I'm your coming talk. to the question in a second. If it's a question, can explain. you state the question and do it briefly? If we please. have on one side the Tories, who, no matter what they talk, at the back of their heart, head, they represent the, the bosses. On the other hand, the Labour's, no matter what they say, at the back of their head, they represent the unions. And the country has been torn by class politics. We had got a third option, which is the Liberal Party. And they say, yeah, we fully agree with you, but it will be a lost vote. So it is a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy, because if everyone said that and felt that, had voted, taken the branch and voted Liberal, this country would have been gone out of this vicious cycle. And it is a vicious cycle, because well, thank, thanks very much for the observation, because yeah. I can see that we really are having a question here. This gentleman here, please. Um, just two brief questions. If we have a hung parliament, and of course if we had proportional representation in a more pure form than AV, we would almost certainly have a hung parliament. Do you agree with Kenneth Clark that, it, as he said in that uh, his famous speech to the press gallery, uh, that it will be very difficult uh, for an incoming government, a minority government in effect, to take the necessary, very difficult economic decisions after May the 6th. And the second point is, in fact, he went further. He said he'd prefer a Labour government with a Labour majority to a minority government. And the, the second point is about AV+. Plus. Having been a member of both the House of Commons and then a member of the Scottish Parliament, uh, MPs, of course, uh, represent, they don't represent all 64, you know, don't all evenly represent 64,000 electors, but at least they, they have a constituency. The problem with the AV plus system in Scotland, which I think the Liberal Democrats, to be fair, have identified, is the fact you've got two tiers of members. You've got a constituency member and a regional member, and the regional member, and I, that was uh, what I was, it covers the equivalent of nine Westminster constituencies, which quite frankly is an impossible job. And you're always in, in competition with, with the constituency members. It's very messy at the constituency level. Yes, well, Kenneth Clark was slapped down by his own leader, actually, for making that comment. Um, he's yeah, he is independent. Um, but, but it's a serious argument, and we need to take it seriously, and you'll hear, about, you'll hear this constantly before polling day. Uh, it is no longer the, the, the wasted vote argument because we've demonstrated that you can not waste your vote uh, by gradually guerrilla warfare, gradually building up the number of MPs. But, but th this argument will be employed. We need a strong government because the economic position is bleak. Um, uh, it, it, and some people will intuitively respond to that. And I think a lot of what I said this evening was providing the counter-argument to that, that a so-called strong government, um, in other, which they tend to mean a majority in the House of Commons, would be elected with one in four of the voters, right? Um, three of the four of the voters have not supported this government, uh, which is going to come in introducing measures of unprecedented severity, which are not understood, which um, will be very strongly resisted unless the public achieve more buy-in than is currently the case. Um, I remember, uh, given my advanced age, the uh, Heath government um, in 1970 that was elected to deal with a very difficult economic situation with a very clear ideological steer, and within two years they were in full retreat. And you can imagine, you know, even a very determined government coming in now, becoming very unpopular very quickly, losing by-elections, losing council elections, troops on the ground getting very demoralised, worrying about what's going to happen at the next general election, finding it very, very difficult to keep going, because this economic crisis isn't going to go away in a year or two years. We're, we're, we're talking about ten years hard slog. And what Ken Clark means by a strong government is not going to be able to deal with it. It just isn't. And uh, uh, although the alternatives may seem in the short run to be messier, uh, any system that has parties working together in what can loosely be described as the national interest is much more likely to work and achieve the 
difficult decisions that are going to be made. This person here with the black t-shirt or there, there we go. I just wanted to make a challenge and get your thoughts on an aspect of proportionality. Um, if we follow one of the, the versions that, um, that your party or that you said that you would go along with, um, you are effectively saying that just because a certain proportion of the population um, agree with the party, and I'll give the example of the BNP, that should overweigh the vast majority of the population that would not like them represented. So. Have you thought about a system such as majority judgment, which would allow a, the majority's view um, to actually take precedence that um, a single um, fringe party should not be represented? Well, I just don't agree that that's a sensible way to conduct a democracy. This has got nothing to do with proportional voting, actually. I mean, the BNP have made a breakthrough in Britain on the first-past-the-post system in local government. That's where they've become entrenched. They built up a substantial number of councillors in parts of the East End and in Burnley and various other places on the first-past-the-post system, not on proportional voting. Um, you can devise, you know, if you want to, you can devise schemes the way the Germans have to keep out nasty fringe parties by setting uh, thresholds, if you want to do that. Actually, I think that's a bad idea. I mean, I, I, I detest the BNP, um, absolutely, and, uh, you know, and I feel emotionally about it, and since I have a mixed-race family of my own, I feel rather threatened by a party that says my family shouldn't exist. So I do feel strongly about it myself, but I think to try to ban them is utterly counterproductive, utterly counterproductive, and uh, they've got to be uh, allowed to have their say, in, if, if, if the public want them to have their say, and they can be taken on. Um, Burnley is a very good example, where they were running, they were running a mock in Burnley, and um, the other parties um, put up a fight. As it happens, my party now controls Burnley, and we may win the parliamentary seat, um, having seen off the BNP. That battle, the people like John Crudus, the Labour MP in Barking, is a very formidable parliamentarian who's taking on the BNP in his borough. And that's the way you have to do it. Trying to find some fiddle uh, to keep them out of being represented, it seems to be wrong in principle and counterproductive. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, my question is, how, how can the uh, hitherto elusive prize of proportional representation for the House of Commons be achieved against the background of the half measures of AV being proposed by Labour and the apparent complete opposition on the part of the Conservative Party? And bearing in mind that you know, the Jenkins Commission got <coughs> kicked into touch and there wasn't much progress in the 70s when there was a, a, a previous inconclusive election. Thanks very much. Uh, well, I, I don't have a route map, actually, to achieve this. Uh, I think if the Labour proposal is taken forward, and I'm not clear that they are taking it forward, I mean, they're talking about it, they have, and they've only got a few days left to get this inserted in the Constitutional Reform Bill, um, if they do it, uh, then there will be a referendum. They will, that's the Tories decide to repeal the idea of a referendum there will be a referendum in the next parliament on the merits of this very limited proposal. Um, so it is now on the, it, it, it's close to being on the agenda. Um, but I, I, think it, I think the logic of what I was saying is that the present system is crumbling in the way that the banking system crumbled and out of crisis um, dramatic solutions emerge. And whether it's in three months' time, probably not, or in four years' time, I think the political conditions will then exist for the kind of big changes that will have to happen. It's only, I, I, I apologise, I forgot to answer the Scottish MP question about two tiers. It, you are right, that is one of the defeat defects of that system. Uh, but we already have um, kind of two-tier parliamentarians in a slightly different way, because as you know, in, in, in government at the moment, we have goats 
um, we have lords and commoners uh, sitting alongside each other, running government, accountable to parliament in very different ways. So, you know, parliamentarians are not all of one species or, at the moment. But you, know, it, it, you do raise a legitimate question that some MPs have a higher status and public backing than others. It is a problem. I'm sorry if the Tsar's UK's, you know, which is kind of to the left or to the right, because I kind of tend to favour listening to him, I lose this side of the audience. Um, go on over there, please, behind you. No, 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 the, behind you, on the right hand side. No, you'll come up afterwards, after the lady first. <laughs> Yeah, this one reaching out. Jessica Levy, researcher to Tony Wright MP. Um, if you could have one, just one reform of the House of Commons, what would it be? Well, the one reform I'm very keen to see is the one I talked about, which is giving Parliament an effective say over public spending decisions, so that so that MPs are forced to take responsibility for public spending choices. And given what's going to happen over the next few years, that would be, I think, desirable as well as right, and it would raise the status and importance of MPs. And this chap here, just, just yes. No, 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 there, yeah, that's it. Uh, Michael Sharpston, aged voter. Uh, <laughs> is there any hope for cabinet government rather than the prime ministerial presidency? Um, I'm not sure how, I mean, given that the Prime Minister chooses the Cabinet, um, it's difficult to see how it would happen. The, the Labour Party, when they were in opposition, tried to get around this problem by choosing a shadow Cabinet of, by MPs rather than by Tony Blair, which they would then translate into government. Uh, and But Blair rebelled and said, you know, how can I be Prime Minister if I don't choose my own ministers? And the system broke down. Um, I, I, I don't think that that's the way forward, actually. I think, I, I'm not, given that there has to be a chairman of the managing directors, or whatever it is, somebody <coughs> leading the government, uh, I think you, you, you ha have to have a primus inter pares in the government, and the issue is about how that cabinet and that prime minister are then effectively held in, held to account. That's what's missing at the moment. Just next to you there. I'm trying to be economic with the footwork as well, so I'll try to move on. We've got time, so. John Cross, I Salon. Uh, two questions, if I may, Vince. Uh, and both concern a kind of feeling in quite what I perceive to be quite a large majority of the population of a feeling of powerlessness and disenfranchisement, having a vote perhaps once every five years, and yet feeling very strongly on a number of subjects which we appear to have no input, apart from obviously direct access to our locally uh, elected MP. And as you very eloquently pointed out, the system of, uh, of prime ministerial uh, diktat as a form of government uh, allows us a feeling of, um, of powerlessness, as I say. How would you respond to making voting compulsory to bring everybody on board? Uh, not only a duty which many feel and take seriously, but a as a legal obligation. And is there a case to be made, in your view, of a perhaps more regular, perhaps annual or biannual referenda? on the most important decisions that the government could take, perhaps decided by a free vote in the Commons? Um, well, compulsory voting, I mean, there is, there is an argument for it in terms of civic duty. I'm not sure that it deals with the issue of powerlessness, because if you're dragged kicking and screaming to the polling booth on the, on the fear of being fined if you don't go, I'm not sure how that enhances your sense of being powerful. Um, I mean, I'd have thought that the system we have at the moment, where um, people can go to the voting rule and put a big, you know, ink mark across the lot of it, or say you're all a bunch of idiots, or whatever they want to say, I mean, does give an opportunity to people who wish to abstain. Um, now, I have mixed feelings about compulsory voting. Of course, it, it, it means that whoever is chosen can then claim that they have the support of the whole 
public, and that, that is, you know, something of a strength. But, you know, not voting is a choice. I mean, it's, you know, it's like voting for the BNP. I mean, you, why, you know, there's some, it seems to me, I feel uncomfortable with the idea of depriving people of an opportunity to make a particular choice, which is just to absent themselves uh, or to, to, to vote for nobody. So I, I think on balance, I, I'm sufficient of a liberal uh, not to favour compulsory voting, though I do see the practical point that you make of it. Um, referendums, well, they are, they are coming in. I mean, gradually, we've had more referendums in the last decade or so, not, not so much in England, but to do with constitutional reform in, in Scotland and Wales um, than, than we'd had in a previous generation. I think we, we do a dividing line at the moment between issues that are constitutional where we are, we, we, we of course we are committed to referendum as a system. I think all the major parties are agreed that if, for example, we took the big step of joining the European single currency, which I don't think is likely to happen in the near future, but that would have to be subject to a referendum. But with, with other issues, it's actually quite difficult to frame them in a way which makes any kind of sense. Um, I mean, I have just a slightly trivial example. There's, there's a sort of very heated planning issue uh, in my constituency to do with the development of the riverside of Twickenham. And, you know, people have views about it. And the, the local, some local activists said, you know, we must have a referendum. This is a, you know, you can't let these councillors and MPs out. We must have a referendum. And they even got the electoral reform system to organise one. And I'm slightly paraphrasing the language of the vote, the, the, of the proposition, but it was something, do you agree that these wicked, greedy property developers <laughs> should be allowed to develop the riverside of Twickenham? Yes or Quite no? Right. And, uh, <laughs> and actually framing issues in a way that uh, can, can be genuine, a genuine test when most decisions in the real world are complex and multidimensional <laughs> is, is difficult. Leave it to the politicians to do the well, same thing. Uh, we do, yes. <laughs> but we can have amendments. We can. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, my name is David Harrington, member of the public. Can I take you to your comfort zone and ask you a question on economics? It, it seems that a lot of people who work in banks are probably smarter than people that board directors and certainly more smarter than the regulators or who are less well paid. So. Do you see any way out of this problem in, if we continue with a sort of free market economy before the next crisis happens? Well, I could speak for a long time on what I would do with the banking system, but the, there are several fundamental reforms which I think have to happen. Uh, I think the banks need to be broken up for a start. And not this sort of rather pathetic line that you're getting at the moment. Is that if the rest of the world do it, we'll do it. I think we have to do it here because the British economy is uniquely exposed to the, the banking system. Banks' balance sheets as a share of British GDP are much higher than in any other Western country except Iceland, Switzerland, Luxembourg. And that's not a good position to be in if you've got you know, 60, 70 million people. Um, and there's a system that's highly unstable. So they've got to be broken up. Um, I think w that there are aspects of bank behaviour that need to be much more firmly regulated than there have been in the past. I think there's now a common view that there are, there are requirements to hold capital, uh, that uh, cash bonuses are extremely risky and dangerous for the system and need to be very severely curbed through regulation. I think we need much more transparency in people's remuneration. All high pay, in my view, should be publicly declared, as it is at the moment for bank directors. And I think we need a much more varied kind of banking ecology, you know, with smaller banks, more competitive, specialist banks, mutuals, local banks, you know, and that's not just a vision because the government has the power to create that because it owns two of the largest banks in the world and it can break them up in a form that creates a much more interesting and varied system. Uh, right in the middle here, there's two people. Give one and then they can pass it over. Right here, the man with the glasses. Sorry, it's just yes. You can pass it along. David Whelan, retired LSE graduate, 
uh, from back in the Dark Ages. Um, could I cheat with two questions? Do you think party electoral campaigns should be funded by the taxpayer with no other financial support? But secondly, House of Lords reform. You mentioned that if you had a, an elected um, House of Lords, you could have two competing Houses of Parliament. I'm not quite clear, therefore, what your own views are about what a reformed House of Lords should be. Um, no, I, I think the principle of public funding or exclusive public funding of parties is, is not something that the public would accept and, and I worry about it in any event. Um, it, it is actually more complex than appears because the, the parties already receive public funding. There's something called short money, which you may have heard of, named after a man called Edward Short, who was a chief whip in the 70s. And uh, So political parties do receive state funding for kind of research kind of infrastructure in Parliament and things of that kind. So there is a degree of state funding already. But I think, I, I, it, it is fair to say, I think my party promoted this idea at one point, but I think it, it's very clear that the public won't buy it. Uh, and that what we are going to have to do is to try to introduce more effective rules on party funding apart from that. And, and one way of doing it is to put an absolute cap on individual donations and a cap on the amount of money that parties can spend within and between election campaigns. And if that's done, and of course you then need control, more effective controls over overseas sources of funding, they get the Ashcroft problem, uh, you know, it clearly needs reform. The reason it's not being reformed is because well, obviously the Conservatives get a lot of large private donations and, you know, quite understandably they're not going to uh, you know, the Turkey's voting for Christmas, and the, 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 the Labour Party depend on the trade unions, and nobody has found a way of applying the capping rules to trade unions, uh, which is fair to them. So that the whole issue is para, para, uh, paralysed. Um, so the second is the, oh, the, the elected House of Lords. Yes, no, I, I believe, and in fact my party's position is that we should have an elected House of Lords. Not exclusively, I think the, the, the view that we voted for, in fact Parliament has a Commons voted for, is that it should be 80%, 80 or 90% elected. Um, I, I stated the arguments against it because I, it, it is a kind of carefully you know, balanced issue. It does no, there's no overwhelming case for one system or another at the moment, but, but I think that is the best. Uh, and the way that, the, probably the best way of doing it is if you had it on a genuinely proportional system, so it would be quite different to the way the House of Commons is elected. You don't need constituencies. You're electing people who will exercise a scrutiny role in Parliament. They're not there to represent Twickenham or Burnley or wherever it is. Uh, so you don't need constituency-based voting system. And probably just elect them for one term. And if that, that's an important point, because if, if MPs are not seeking re-election, they can exercise much more independence. Um, so you, you could devise an elected House of Lords that fitted within the structure uh, in a way that is mutually supportive rather than conflictual, but it would be quite a difficult design. The person with the mic, and then if you could pass it down to the lady with the multicoloured hair. After he's, you'll get it after he's had it. Um, Guy Burton, also the London School of Economics as well. It's just a question about electoral reform, and I was curious if you maybe sort of allude to, I'm curious to know what you think about the impact of electoral reform on the party system. And the reason... Because I mentioned one, and the second one, and the Liberal Democrats themselves are responsible for it. I remember the last election, they had an advert, a map of Britain with life. to understand who you are in three seconds of looking at the map. But well, if the Liberal Democrats were real serious, they put it very simple and short to the point, telling him, look, if you want Britain to get out of this vicious cycle of class politics, just vote Liberal, fair, the third option. Eastern Europe, but, but there again, I mean, 
they always have the, they have the guts the first to experiment with socialism and the first to get out of it class politics has lost its charm and its applicability for some times now but this country hasn't adjusted itself to this fact class politics is a product of the 18th and 19th century which is an admirable thing but things have changed okay, and, and the third again, actually, the third because cycle I would actually like to hear from yeah, the th here. no just it won't take your fraction no, it has already the You've third had two cycle the elbow, and you haven't asked the question the really third much. cycle the third <laughs> cycle mic, is thank you there Could is you 20 hand up the mic? thank you Hello. Hi, um, my name is Virginia Sentence and I'm a first year at LSE. I was just wondering if you think that electoral reform could actually cause more confusion and laziness and so therefore lower voter turnout. If it, if it could what, sir? Oh, if, if electoral confusion. reform could cause more confusion and laziness and therefore less voter turnout? Well, th there is obviously, you know, a, a danger of, if it's not done properly and if it's not done with proper voter education and involvement. Um, as I say, we have had now limited experiments with electoral reform in the UK. I think it works well in most contexts except 